Shalom, shalom, my Havarim. Greetings, my YouTube mishpaha. What's up, my people? And welcome, or welcome back, to Bible on a Bicycle. My name is Will, and I'm an aspiring follower of Yeshua HaMashiach. You might know him as Jesus Christ. And what is the Supercuts fan edit? Well, a Bible on a Bicycle Supercuts fan edit is where we go out and we tackle a particular subject or topic from within the pages of or surrounding the Bible. And then first and foremost, we take it to our Bibles, reading the scripture for ourselves and within context whenever applicable. And then I go out so you don't have to. And I gather up all the varying and often opposing opinions, viewpoints, teachings, and preachings from various theologians, scholars, teachers, and preachers. You know, folks that are way more educated than I and way better spoken than this old guy. Then I gather that all up. Once we have a big old pile of information and opinions, I chop, chop. Chop, chop that all up. And through the mysterious science of video editing, I take that all and I mush it all back together, hopefully into something cohesive and comprehensive. And then I serve it right up to you in the form of a supercut span. And in this here little video, we're going to be getting to one of the very basics in our faith, and that is the name of God. What is that name of God revealed all the way back there to Moses that I pronounce Yahweh? But am I pronouncing that correctly? And is it the pronunciation part that we really should be concerned with? Let's delve into the ancient Hebrew language and culture and find out exactly what this four-letter name is from within the pages of our Bible. And in order to do that, we're not going to rely on me. We're going to rely on two fellows that are way more educated in this field of linguistics and biblical culture than I am. And those gentlemen being, firstly, Jeff Benner, a biblical linguist, author, speaker, and yes, he is here on YouTube. Check out those links down below. And then in the other corner, with a slightly differing view, is the late, great Dr. Michael Heiser, theologian, scholar, author, and one of my personal favorite teachers when it comes to the Bible. So grab yourself a coffee or your favorite beverage, get your Bible handy so you can follow along as I turn it over to these guys. And we delve into the name of God. Alrighty. Yahweh is the best guess. The short form of the divine name, the first first part, is Yah. We know that because it's always pointed with an A vowel everywhere. There are no exceptions. So the scribal you know, tradition is very clear that the first syllable is Yah. Mm -hmm. uh, what about the second syllable? If you believe, and Exodus 3 certainly suggests this, that the divine name is based on the to be verb, okay, in Hebrew, Biblical Hebrew, it's Hayah, H-Y-H. We're going to take a look at the Ehya Esher Ehya, or as it's often translated, I am who I am, or I am that I am, as found in Exodus 3, verse 14. But we're going to look at it in context with uh, the verse before it and the verse after it, because there's some interesting clues here about the character and the name of Yahweh. Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. And Moshe said to the Elohim, Look, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, Elohim of your fathers sent me to you. And they will say to me, What is his name? What will I say? And Elohim said to Moshe, Ehya asher Ehya. And he said, Thus you will say to the sons of Israel, 
Ehya sent me to you. The name Elohim gives to Moshe is Ehya. In pre-biblical Hebrew and across the board in, in, in other Semitic languages, there's a, again, this is technical, but H-W-H is the spelling. W and Y in, as a middle consonant in Semitic languages are interchangeable. So that's why you get this W instead of the Y for the 2B verb, even though the 2B the verb is haya, you get this hawa thing going on. So if the divine name is based on that, think about the Exodus story. You know, I am that I am. If you can read some Hebrew, that's first person, right? I am that I am. It's eh, yeah, okay? If we're referring to God in the third person, we can't use eh, yeah, because that's first person. So the question is, what is it in the third person? You've got two choices. If you have the H, W, H as your root, in the third person, in the what's called the imperfect form, you put a Y on the front. It can be Yahweh or Yahweh. Now, let's take a look at that phrase that we saw in verse 14. Ehia, asher ehia. Here we have the word ehia. And then the word asher. Asher is the relative pronoun. It can be translated as which, who, what, because. It depends on the context of how this is used and how we're going to translate it. We can translate that as I will exist because I will exist. I exist because I exist. I am who I am. We could also translate this as, I will be who I will be, or I am that which exists. When a translator is translating the text, he has to decide what that best translation is to put in the text. In other words, he would choose from like one of these five, or and there's also other choices as well, he would choose one of these and then put that into the text. However, because the Hebrew language is so dynamic, it's, it's not which one of these five is the best translation of the text. In fact, all five of these convey the idea in Ehya Asha Ehya. That's how dynamic the Hebrew language is. You really cannot translate one Hebrew word with one English word and convey the, the entire meaning of the Hebrew. In fact, it would even be better to translate one Hebrew word with an entire sentence in English because of the richness of the Hebrew language. So don't look to, at these five to, to say which one you think best fits the idea in this verse. Instead, recognize that all of this encompasses the meaning of Eya asher Eya. Now let's take a look at the next verse. Verse 15. And Elohim said again to Moshe, Thus you will say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh, Elohim of your fathers, Elohim of Avraham, Elohim of Yitzchak, and Elohim of Yaakov sent me to you. This is my name for a long time, and this is my memorial for generation and generation. Elohim again gives his name to Moshe, but this time it is Yahweh. The two names, Yahweh and Ehya, are related. Here's the verb Haya, again, which we discussed earlier, and here's the Hebrew verb Hawa, He, Wa, He. Let's take a look at this verb, hawa. It is virtually identical in meaning and use as the verb haya. The first person is ehwa, and that means I exist or I am. The second person, tihwa, you exist or you are. And the third person, yihwe. He exists or he is. Do you notice here that the third person 
of the verb hawa is spelled yod he vav he. Remember, all Hebrew names are words with meaning. Therefore, names like Jehovah, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yehovah, etc., mean nothing in Hebrew because none of these words are Hebrew words. They, they mean nothing in the Hebrew language. So, in my opinion, the pronunciation of the name yod heh vav is Yigwe. I should point out why I use the W rather than a V for the letter Vav. In modern Hebrew, the sixth letter of the alphabet is the letter Vav, which has a V sound. However, it can also take on the O or the U vowel sounds. There is some controversy over this in that there are those who believe that in ancient times, this letter was the letter Wa and had a W sound along with the O and the U. Personally, I believe that it was a Wa, a W sound. And there's evidence for this. One of those is that four of the letters in the Hebrew alphabet doubled as consonants and vowels. These are the Aleph, the He, the Wa, and the Yud. The Yod, for example, can be the consonant Y or the vowel I or E. Notice that the Y and the E are very similar in sound. In the same way, the Wa or W is similar to O and U. Another piece of evidence is that Arabic, which is almost identical to Hebrew in its alphabet, does not have a Vav, it has a Wa, and it's pronounced with a W. It's possible that the V sound may have come from a Germanic European influence. So rather than Yive, it would be Yihue. Now, we know it should be Ya because of the short form. Mm -hmm. So Yahweh is something in Hebrew called the Hifil stem of the to be verb, and it means he who causes to be, he who brings into being. And the context fits really well because what's the burning bush about? And from that point on, you know, you have this, you know, the divine name revealed. It, it's a new act of, it's bringing Israel back to life. Okay, it's, it's a supernatural, you know, creation, you know, recreation of a people, you know, out of Egypt and all that kind of stuff. However, I do not believe that the focus should be on how the name is pronounced, but instead on what that name is means. Let's take a look at Exodus 20 verse 7 from the King James Version. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. We've had many people interpret this verse many, many different ways, but in my opinion, looking at this Hebraically, literally what this verse is saying, you shall not lift up the character of Yahweh falsely. But I believe this verse is saying that we are the representatives of Yahweh. We take his character, the word, the Hebrew word for name, Shem, means character, and place it within us. Now, as his representatives, if we go out and lie, steal, or cheat, we're now representing his character falsely. Another verse is Numbers 6, 27. And they, the Kohanim, the priests, shall put my name upon the children of Israel. Now, at first glance here, this really doesn't make a lot of sense because how do you put a name on a people? Are they supposed to write this on them? But we have to understand that the Hebrews wrote very concretely. They used concepts that you can see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. So what this is talking about is taking the character of Yahweh and giving it to the people. Interestingly, this verse comes right after the Aaronic blessing. And the Aaronic blessing describes the entire character of Yahweh. 
then the Kohanim are supposed to take this character, which is the name, not just a name like four letters, but the character of Yahweh, and teach it to the people so that they now have the character of Yahweh within them. So a lot of mainstream scholars will recognize all of that. Yahweh, Yahweh is, is how we would sort of anglicize it. The, the reason why it's not a complete consensus, and this is how this will give you a little insight into how scholars think, is well, we can't find the third person hifil causative form of the to be verb in other Semitic languages. It's unique in biblical Hebrew. So therefore we don't know that we, you know, should say it's Yahweh for sure. It looks that way, but we'd like to have another example from another Semitic language. Personally, if it makes good sense in context and it makes good sense in terms of morphology, what's the problem? In summary, these three verses that we looked at, Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 to 15, we see the Ehya Asher Ehya. We looked at that from a Hebraic perspective on what that phrase means. But then we also recognize that Yahweh has two names. Ehya, which means I exist, I will exist, I am. And also Yehweh, which means he exists, he will exist, he is. And both of these names are related to each other. Both of these names are conveying the idea that Yahweh is the existing one. One thing that we must keep in mind, in the ancient Hebrew thought, only that which can be experienced exists. One of the major differences between Hebrew thought and Greek thought is that Hebrew thought only concerns itself with that which you know, that which you can see, hear, smell, taste, or touch. Greek thought, on the other hand, goes beyond that, the abstract. What is out there? that I have not experienced. Sciences are developed out of Greek thought. Hebrew thought cannot develop the sciences because of its way of thinking. Israel in Egypt had not experienced Yahweh, therefore to them, he did not exist. So Moshe's question to Elohim is, they're gonna ask me who you are. What am I gonna tell them? What is your name? What is your character? And his response is, I am the one who exists because I am the one who exists. Well, there you have it. The name of our Lord. Me, myself, I'm going to stick with Yahweh. Yahweh. Not only do I believe that's the closest pronunciation according to all the evidence that I can find, but quite frankly, I like the way it comes out. Yahweh. But, like Jeff said, I think it's more important that we focus on the meaning of the name and what it means for us to represent that name, to be image bearers. If that's just my opinion, I'd be interested in what your opinion on this whole matter is. How do you pronounce the name of our creator, creator? And why? And where do you stand on this whole matter? Me, myself, I'm not big on the whole pronunciation as long as we know we're speaking about the same God of the Bible, the one and only Elohim of Elohim, the Most High. And I think that's what's really important. Anyway, thank you for being here today. I know your time is valuable, and I appreciate you being here and spending a little bit with us. You know the routine. If you're not already subscribed, hit that little subscribe button. Give some love with that thumbs up. Make sure you share this little video with any friends or family members you think might benefit from or enjoy watching this video. Hope to see you next time. And until next time, remember, Yeshua, Jesus loves you. So do I. Now get off of here. Go ride your bike and read your Bible.
Ha, ha, ha.